Um, I was wondering if you could just give us uh, a window into how your story begins in terms of intersecting mm -hmm. with refugees in particular and um, take us back to some of those uh, earlier connections and nudges from God in terms of getting connected with uh, refugees. It almost feels accidental in a way because it wasn't my intention uh, to be involved with refugees um, initially. Uh, and I bet there's a lot of stories like that where mm -hmm. something just happens and all of a sudden you're with refugees and uh, intersecting with them. So uh, probably, yeah, it, I'm not unique to this, but um, I, when I was in my late teens, uh, I read a lot of uh, missionary biographies and so mm -hmm. on uh, and felt a call to um, long-term ministry. So I went to Prairie Bible College in Alberta and uh, part of my intercultural studies degree was to do a cross-cultural internship, mm -hmm. which I did with Arab World Ministries in North Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that experience in North Africa, I felt, I don't think I'm ready to uh, just go out as a single uh, female missionary into the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Arab World Ministries was starting Adam House. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a refugee home here in Toronto. Uh, and they said, would you be interested in uh, working at this refugee home? And I thought that it might be a bit of a stepping stone. Uh, I would learn more about culture uh, and people from around the world. Mm -hmm. And then maybe I'd be back overseas uh, in a couple of years. But I sort of fell in love with what I was doing here hmm. uh, and the refugees that we saw come through our doors and the ways that we were able to help them and to minister to people from all over the world right yeah. here uh, in Toronto. So it was never my intention. I didn't hear about refugees and seek out a refugee mm -hmm. work. I sort of just fell into it and then... Um, that has been an 18 year long uh, history and passion for me mm -hmm. since then. You mentioned Adam House, and of course, uh, you're currently sitting as the executive director. Um, can you just flesh out a bit more of the context of uh, how you're involved with refugees now? And that might be a bit of a summary of Adam House and, um, and what kinds of things you're involved in now. Yeah. Uh, so Adam House is a home that serves refugee claimants. So that's unsponsored refugees who have somehow come to Canada and uh, they go to immigration and say, or even upon arrival with the CBSA officers say, mm -hmm. hey, I need protection. Um, I can't go back to my country mm -hmm. of origin. Mm -hmm. um, so a refugee claimant has to go through a process um, of going to the Immigration and Refugee Board, their case being heard and then being accepted, then they can become a permanent resident. So we help them through that process and they stay here at the house for about four months while mm. they initialize all of that uh, and start settlement, things like ESL and so on. Um, so we have 23 beds here at Adam House and last year we opened a transitional home in North York, which has 14 more beds. Mm -hmm. So families or individuals that need extra support beyond four months mm -hmm. uh, can go and live there mm -hmm. um, uh, for about a year. Um, is We've only been going for a year, so it, it remains to be seen how that will work exactly, but probably mm -hmm. about a year. Um, so. Uh, while they're here, we support them in whatever way they w that we can. Uh, some mm -hmm. people know English, um, so we might connect them to other educational resources or training. Uh, we help um, with things like socialization mm -hmm. uh, and uh, programming, uh, whatever. It's so unique for each mm -hmm. person that it's hard to 
uh, sort of write down a path, but mm -hmm. uh, there's certainly uh, things like immigration, legal aid, uh, social services that are all fairly typical for people uh, that we help them through. And just even the immigration process and work permits, study permits, things like that. So. And it sounds like the ability to have them uh, apply and, and come and be a part of the community there then gives you that uh, ability to tailor um, some of the resources that are needed and to walk with them for that period of time. And um, yes. so some of the, uh, sounds like the foundation is the relationship that's there. And then there are a number of options um, to provide specific kinds of support. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, one of the, that's one of the unique things here compared to maybe a refugee shelter mm -hmm. is that relational aspect and uh, being able to help people on a very uh, individual le level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you, um, you started here, it was 18 years ago? Yeah, 2002. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and so in that time, the story may have changed and grown and, and it's shaped differently now. Um, I'm wondering if you could just uh, help us understand how Adam House provides structure for individuals or churches to participate along with you in what you're doing. Um, yeah, it certainly has changed. I think when we started, we had uh, Bible studies on... Tuesday evenings, and that hasn't changed. We have Bible, except for COVID-19. Now mm -hmm. we don't have Bible studies because of the pandemic. But other than that, we've been consistent throughout our history in having a Bible study on Tuesday evenings. Um, but initially, it was an internally led thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that has morphed um, and uh, grown uh, Maybe 10 years ago or so, uh, a church came to us and suggested running Alpha uh, during the Bible study time. And with that came the idea of having a meal together. Previously, we had had the Bible study and then some snacks and coffee and tea, um, but that turned into a full-blown meal, which has continued up until today. Um, and after Alpha ended, we wondered, is this, is it a good time to get churches involved in this Bible study beyond Alpha? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that a way for churches to get to know refugees mm -hmm. uh, and refugees get to know community members in mm -hmm. Canada? Um, and what would that look like? So um, we started doing that and then the excitement and participation interest in that grew so much that we decided to make a second evening every week. Um, actually, I think we started off bi-weekly. So mm -hmm. we started a social program on Friday nights, which is now every uh, Friday night. Mm -hmm. um, and that's less emphasis on the spiritual. Um, so it kind of opens it a little bit wider, but still run by churches. Mm -hmm. um, so church people still have the opportunity to interact with refugees and refugees get to know community members through this social programming. Mm -hmm. um, and it's more of a games night and it looks different for every church that comes to do it. Um, for some, it's more of a coffee and chat. Others mm -hmm. are more into board games or mm -hmm. Dutch Blitz, things like that. So there's now refugees playing Dutch language. Blitz. Yeah. What's that? Now you're speaking my love language. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Dutch Blitz, I know a lot of people in EMCC are probably diehards. <laughs> I was growing up. So yeah. just across from my office here, there can be people play at uh, refugees from mm -hmm. all over the world. Dutch Blitz uh, mm -hmm. and many other good games. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's been uh, amazing to get churches involved because I think, firstly, it really helps churches and Christians to understand um, refugees better. Mm. Not, not necessarily by hearing their stories because those can be quite private and personal, mm -hmm. but 
to walk with them through mm -hmm. some of their immigration and settlement struggles mm -hmm. um, and to see a person who can let go and have fun or misses their family uh, yeah. and so on so it's yeah it's really neat and it's a very symbiotic re relationship because um, both are blessed mm -hmm. through it. Um, the churches are blessed by their interactions and our, our residents get something out of it too. Uh, friendship, mm -hmm. maybe a job, um, mm -hmm. being connected to someone who might have an apartment to rent. So mm -hmm. exactly. those sort of things. So, so I think previous to that, previous to starting uh, the, the specific church engagement, I think that more of the church connections were individual um, volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, so very individualistic. This is more of a team effort from a church. Um, and many of the, the church teams meet together regularly, communicate regularly about their ministry here. So mm -hmm. I think it creates uh another layer to the relationships in local churches also so For sure lots of benefits absolutely yeah. um take us from there uh just beyond the church if you don't mind because uh, one of the um one of the realities and we're seeing this all over the world that as god um prompts the existence of um these ngos um, and um, support agencies that function outside of the walls of the church. Um, you're a faith-based organization working essentially in the public space. And so um, can you just tell us a little bit about how that's going, collaborating with those outside or beyond the church? On a day-by-day -day basis, it's good. Um, and there is a coalition of refugee service providers in Ontario uh, that meet regularly and it's secular organizations alongside faith-based uh, and we have very good um, relationships with them, learn from each other um, and I think certainly a lot of secular organizations see the value in, in the faith-based uh, but at times it's tricky, especially when we say Bible study. Mm -hmm. um, so often when I say Bible study, oh, well, is it mandatory? That's the first right. question that people ask. They think we're, we're forcing people to come to Bible study. Um, but it's just something that we offer as part of our programming. If people want to, to learn about Jesus or, or if they're Christians already, they want to mm -hmm. come and, and worship and uh, be part of that. Um, so it's not mandatory. Uh, <laughs> I'll just put that out. Um, not mandatory, but uh, yeah, it's often seen as um, yeah. I think people people question it a little bit and mm -hmm. and uh, wonder about its place. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there are other faith based um, refugee homes that don't do this. Mm -hmm. uh, that don't do a Bible study. Uh, and are more, to use uh, <laughs> a common term on the down low, uh, that it's like, oh, our relationship, mm -hmm. uh, our love will, will show people, mm -hmm. will communicate who Jesus is. And I think we've always been of the mind that, yes, we have to have that love, but if we never speak a word about Jesus, then... Um, then how will they know mm -hmm. where this love and um, and care comes from? So mm -hmm. that's why we've maintained it as part of our programming. And I think that that can kind of, um, yeah, just be questionable to people. Mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. Yeah, for whatever reason. It also, we've, we've decided to stay away from uh, any sort of government funding for that reason as well. I mean, we have some like Canada summer jobs, um, yeah. but yeah. no, no uh, regular programming uh, funding coming mm -hmm. uh, from the government because we want to um, continue that uh, ministry to people mm -hmm. without barriers. And uh, because even being part of the coalition, um, provides a voice at the table and 
Um, and, you know, I think it's important to not underestimate that um, living open-handedly in a secular view to be perceived that you're always going to be proselytizing um, mm -hmm. is, is not the case um, because it's a dishonoring of the gospel itself that um, we are witnesses to what we have learned and what we've come to know in Jesus and people can see it in our lives and we can tell them about Jesus um, without any, uh, without any indication that we save anybody because we don't. Um, but we offer, uh, just as we are those who have discovered eternal life, we, we can offer that to others in true friendship and relationship, but open-handedly. And I, I think, I think the, the world is, uh, is wise to understand that that's how faith actually works. Uh, even in biological family to your next generation, um, there, you never force anybody um, to accept Christ. You, uh, you model and you help and you guide and you teach and you allow the spirit to do the spirit's work. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I think it's really helpful answer. Thank you. Okay. Good. Um, what, what are some of the biggest things you've been um, either learning or that you've received personally in your engagement with refugees? And just tell us a little bit more about that. When I started here, I was 22, hmm. no, 23, maybe 23. I was young and very green. Uh, and even though I took an intercultural studies degree, mm -hmm. I don't think that ever fully prepares you um, for for what I what you do in the world uh, mm -hmm. when you're in ministry cross culturally. Um, and I don't even just work with one culture. Mm -hmm. We work here with we've had people from probably a hundred different nations. Uh, over the years. So that's a lot of cultures. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest things I've learned is just that you can't be an expert at all of it. Even if you're just learning one culture, you can't know it completely. Mm -hmm. You can know a lot, but you can't know it completely. And so to take the posture of a learner mm -hmm. and to ask questions and to be willing to laugh at your mistakes and apologize for your mistakes um, as you're making them. Because we come from a culture ourselves and cannot ever fully become um, a cultural culture, right. you know? Like we can't, yeah, I couldn't be a Kenyan, mm -hmm. right? Or, or a Nigerian or a Colombian. Um, I'm a Canadian who might adopt some uh, culture from other places, but I can't fully become that. Um, so yeah, taking that attitude of a learner and not being afraid to also teach uh, a culture as well. Mm -hmm. uh, because people who are coming here also have things to learn as well. They can't continue to be 100% whatever culture they were. They need to uh, mm -hmm. learn some things here too. So just being learners together uh, in culture, uh, I think that's probably one of my biggest mm -hmm. learnings. Um, and then received personally, uh, the list is honestly too long, Joel. I like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't, the friendships um, that I have with people um, who have gone through here, because in social work, it, if I was working at a refugee shelter and I was a social worker, I wouldn't be allowed to have the personal connection, mm -hmm. the friendship that we're, we're able to maintain because this is a ministry. So half of my friends on Facebook came through Adam House, mm -hmm. at least. And um, a lot of my friends are people who came through here. Uh, so just, I'm, yeah, it's, it's immeasurable. The times I've been helped or prayed for or uh, whatever, it's just, unbelievable the blessings that have been poured on my life from refugees mm -hmm. yeah thanks for opening up that window for us um, 
<laughs> it's good. <laughs> Let the rain come in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's true, though. Like, people have been asking um, this question in the last couple of years, like, since a lot of refugees started coming over mm -hmm. um, the border from the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, post-Trump's election. Mm -hmm. um, there was such a big influx of refugee claimants. And in any media that I did, uh, people often asked, how could you get someone to understand a refugee better? Mm -hmm. And my answer is always, just get to know one. Mm -hmm. Just one. You only mm -hmm. need one refugee to change your life, to mm -hmm. see that they're just a person mm -hmm. who's looking for something better for themselves or their children to live in freedom mm -hmm. instead of um, imprisonment, uh, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. whether they can't be who they are, whether uh, they can't express their political opinion, mm -hmm. um, whether they live in a refugee camp and there's no hope for their children to ever leave and receive an education, whatever it is, right? They're, they're coming for something better and which one of us wouldn't do the same for our children, right? Exactly. We're not in the position where we have to fight for that. So mm -hmm. we don't necessarily understand it, but yeah. getting to know a refugee, you see why they struggle for something better. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that they're, they're a person. They're just a person. Yeah. Yep. And I appreciate you characterizing it in terms of friendship as well. Um, because when you open up your heart um, to others and walk with them, um, that is actually a deeply spiritual reality that God gives us yeah. love for one another and friendship and respect. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it's great to hear you talk about it in that way. And I hope that your story inspires some others uh, to think about points of connection or availability um, for them to serve uh, those whom God is bringing into their communities. Um, and so, yeah, uh, thank you for this. Uh, before we close off, I um, just want to give you an opportunity to list any specific ways that people can be praying for you and for Adam House. And there will be some uh, links that will be on the website as well um, so that people can uh, follow up with you in any way. <laughs> 